so what it tries to tell us is that okay the total loss is the loss given default into a multiple right because if you look at this unexpected loss right if you look at this unexpected loss this is some multiple of the expected loss some given multiple now to quantify that multiple what we are looking into is into the lgv what i'm saying is that the total amount of capital that you need to keep aside right is a function of the total loss uh, or the unexpected loss multiplied by some factors right which is your asset correlation factor which may be a maturity factor and so on so the question that comes out is how is it that this total uh, loss will be computed so what is the bar the bar is this entire uh, this entire portion right starts from here right up to here this entire line segment right? and this what is this line segment so this line segment or this entire length is nothing but it's a part of your uh, so basically you want to know, you want to you want to take the you know the total loss at which extent so let's say at 99% confidence interval you take it right so that's the total var or, or that's the total loss that you are going to on so that's the total value at risk and that will be some multiple of your lgd so what you see is that it is some multiple plus this uh, r by 1 minus r which is your there r is your um, you know r is your recovery uh, sorry it's your uh, asset correlation factor so on right so over here let's see uh, what are these uh, what are the components of this capital requirement so they show that there are three uh, components to this one is you divide upon a conservative value of the systematic factor then you derive the uh, default threshold and then you derive a conservative value of the systematic factor right so these are the three components so basically at the end of the day what you are trying to do is you are trying to find out the total loss that has happened in the economy and which is obviously a multiple of the loss given default from there you are subtracting out the expected loss which is pd into lgv so you are left finally with your so you are subtracting the pd minus pd into lgv so you are you are sub finally left with the unexpected loss right and that unexpected loss is this 1.15 into and uh, so that uh, that is multiplied with this particular factor right to get to your capital requirement right so this unexpected loss that we have over here is estimated using your uh what should i say so it is estimated using your uh this thing your rwa right i'm just trying to reach out to that but uh we'll do the maturity adjustments whatever huh. so over here as you go ahead you know one by one you will see that each of these components have been kind of identified i has been described in this paper right so all the components in the capital formula so that that is easier or that's helpful for understanding stuff right so you can have a look into that so that would be a great under that would provide you a good understanding right so <clears throat> so coming back so coming back to this so so obviously one thing we can see is that to compute the unexpected loss we need the var and we need the expected loss and that's why the pdlgd ead becomes so important from model development concept because once these three models are developed the remains the remaining ones follow as a result right so the next thing that we'll talk about is the next thing that we'll talk about over here is that 
so uh, okay so we have talked about the expected losses unexpected losses uh, this part is done fine now the next part that we uh, need to understand is on the stress test itself right so over here the question that comes out is that okay basil had given us this framework right and i keep aside this capital i am good to go then why do i again need a uh, what should i say so why do i again need a a separate stress testing regulation i need a stress testing regulation to ensure that that as my macroeconomic scenarios change right would that capital help me maintain that or would help me maintain solvency because while i maintain the capital i also have capital distribution plans i give out dividends to my stakeholders i give out dividends to i i give out interests uh, to my uh shareholder uh, i mean to my deposit holders right there is always a capital distribution plan even though interest uh, giving out interest is not a part of capital distribution plan so so what i'm trying to develop over here is i'm trying to have an understanding of exactly how the model is developed or or how is it that this work is done yeah so basically when i'm trying to develop this uh, you know so when i talk about the stress testing exercise so basically what happens is that banks are involved into capital distribution plans right so banks are develop uh, so banks have their capital distribution plans in place the banks pay out dividends banks have other capital distribution plans now when they are doing that what is most important to realize is that while doing that that why why they are doing that and they are keeping inside their capital the question that comes out is that can the banks actually afford to do that can the banks actually afford to make that capital distribution plan that they are doing right and this is where the question comes up and this is where you know the role of stress testing documents come out right or stress testing frameworks actually come out and regulations like ccar bfas uh, they actually require the banks to test whether the amount of capital that they are keeping back are substantial right given their capital distribution plan so while one major difference between ccar and bfas is that bfas says that okay fine i take it that you are uh, you have a given uh, Uh, strategy of capital distribution now given that i want to know so given that i'm trying to see whether is the capital that you are keeping is correct or not so whatever capital whatever if you pass if you even you don't pass the dfas test right dfas does not have any implications on your actual capital distribution plan whereas when i talk about d uh, ccar ccar has a direct impact ccar has a direct impact on your capital distribution plan right so what these things they do is they create three scenarios right so they create a baseline scenario a severe scenario a uh, adverse scenario and a severely adverse scenario and under each of these three scenarios what they try to do is they try to understand that how would the balance sheet of the bank look like under these three scenarios right so under each of these three scenarios the models are developed right mm. and once the models are developed there what do you do is so you you can look into okay and under stress scenario this is how my pnl is going to look and this is how my balance sheet is going to look now given this can the bank afford to give the can the bank actually pursue its given capital distribution plan so if you do not pass the ccar test you have to first keep aside the capital and then given that capital which passes the ccar test then you can go and decide whether this should be or whether the capital distribution plan of the bank should be possible or not right so that is where this thing is or this is where this uh, stress testing regulations become important
right? And all these, and both these regulations, they are focused towards the capital in ensuring that the bank has adequate amount of capital which can be used for uh, multiple, uh, uh, you know, so which can be used for multiple purposes. So, uh, so whether the bank is adequately capitalized or not. So even over there, right, PDLZD and EAD models would play a very critical role because, because from there, you know, you, you will always try to get an idea as to how is it that these would look like or, or how is it that these scenarios or these things would look like under the respective scenario. So how is it that your salary, let's say, let's take a variable salary, right? Salary is a component in a PNL statement. Now, under stress scenarios, how, how is it that it would look like? So under uh, a baseline scenario, how is it going to look like? Under an adverse scenario, how is it going to look like? Right? So when you stress that, you try to understand that how this particular exercise is going to work. Fine. So basically, so so over here, you know, our objective would be because because we are kind of uh, because if you try to uh, talk about C car models, right? We need to talk about how scenarios are designed, how are scenarios develop. The next thing that we need to talk about is how is it that once you once the scenarios are designed, how is it that each of the balance sheet items are stressed? Now there are multiple balance sheet items. I cannot do everything. I'll I'll use one or two to show you how they are developed, right? So how is it a PD model stress under each of these three scenarios, how, right? And how is it that these stress tested results are used in ECL computation? So that is what we would be trying to do over here, right? So because so everything would be revolving around your PD, LGD and EAD models. And that's why, you know, the Basel models that we talk about are, uh, I mean, Basel, when we talk about Basel models, these three, become so important right now given that basil talks about uh, capital structures it talks about uh, maintaining adequate amount of capital it talks about the different capital structure of the bank so the way basil actually assess a business or assesses a bank's portfolio is from its risk exposures right so it assesses the products or any uh, banking product from the risk exposure that it's that that particular asset has and given that risk exposure what we generally do is the table into or we divide the bank's portfolio into two broad parts this is the risk exposure one is your retail the other is your commercial so so any bank you know uh, so the credit risk portfolio, the credit portfolio of a bank can broadly at a very high level be divided into these two parts. One is your retail and the other is your commercial. Okay. So, so over here, uh, the risk exposure that we have is something which is, uh, you know, we have the retail and we have the commercial books. So on the retail books, so, so basically, basis the risk exposure, right? The bank divides the behavior of the, or, or the bank divides the entire portfolio into retail and commercial. So the question that we next need to address is that how do we define retail in the books of a bank, right? How is it that retail is defined? And the second point that we talk about over here is how is it that commercial is defined how is it that retail is defined and how is it that commercial is defined so that's the next part right so uh, and when we talk about these portfolios right, we will talk about retail portfolio we will talk about commercial portfolios Right, and within that, within that, the basis there is the type of the risk exposure. The portfolios are subdivided. So basically, what is a retail product? So retail products are products which caters to the households, right? So it includes products like credit cards. It includes products like personal loans. It includes products like home loans, uh, travel loans, 
uh, education loans, auto loans, as well as it includes loans like uh, mortgages and so on. So basically, retail can be secured as well as it would be unsecured. On the other hand, retail loans could be, uh, uh, what should I say, it could be kind of, uh, so when Bazin defines a retail product, right, it would de it defines it from two aspects. It defines it from its penetration and it defines it from its exposure. So basically from the penetration perspective, Basil says that, okay, a retail product is a product where there are large number of borrowers, right? So if you look into the into a retail product, like uh, an, into a retail product base, you have millions of accounts, right? You have one more than a million of accounts. On the other hand, when you look at a commercial space, the number of accounts reduces largely because the reason being that in commercial portfolios, the number of businesses are relatively lower than the number of households. So in every household, let's say I work for a company, right? So there is one company or there are, uh, so there is one company where one working member of the household works, but each of the three household members have their own credit cards. So at any point of time, if I just look into one single household with one single one single house with a one single household, I know that yes, there is a very huge difference between these two, uh, between, between the size of the two portfolios. So if this one commercial concern takes a loan from the bank, there is this one record, whereas the credit card portfolio will have three records. <coughs> now the, what this means for the bank is, or uh, yeah, so what this means is that at any point of time, the from the account perspective, the portfolios will have less number of accounts. The commercial portfolio will have less number of accounts and hence the number of defaults in those portfolio would be lower. Whereas, let's say in, in a commercial portfolio, there can be 100 borrowers, there are 100 accounts, right? And there is a 1% default rate or 1 point or say 2% default rate. So it means that out of the 100 accounts, you just have two accounts which are defaulted. On the other hand, in a retail portfolio where you have millions of accounts, even if you have two to three percent of uh, two to three percent of uh, defaults, right? Then you know that that two to three percent of like two million or three million is some lacks of defaults, right? So, in terms of the number of borrowers who are using this product, so the the base, the penetration of these borrowers is actually very high. <coughs> Right. So therefore, uh, retail accounts are identified as accounts which have very large number of borrowers, but the individual exposure of each account is actually very less. Right. So when I talk about the individual exposure of each account, it means the amount outstanding or the balance on the cards which are given to these retail borrowers is actually very less and this is where you know the difference between commercial borrowers and so this is the main difference between which crops are between commercial and the retail borrowers right so having looked into this framework having looked into this one thing that can be identified is that the way in which you model your commercial portfolios and the way in which you model your behavior, your retail portfolios would be very different. 